Welcome to Todd and Eve's show, where in a fit of amateur naturalistic decision-making analysis, as we'll talk about on this podcast, I attempt to unpack the mental models of interesting people and learn out loud for my benefit and the benefit of folks who listen along as well. This week on the podcast, we have Cedric Chin. Cedric writes a blog called Common Cog, which is absolutely fantastic. He takes a lot of pretty insightful yet abstract ideas from communities like the rationality community, uh, some of the the skill acquisition stuff written about by Anders Ericsson, naturalistic decision-making, like we talked about a second ago. And a lot of these concepts were also popularized by Malcolm Gladwell. And he tries to put them together into really actionable, helpful stuff for people who are in knowledge work. And so this is a, a very useful thing to do since there's a lot of really good information out there about how to actually get better at understanding things. But a lot of it is pretty impractical. So I actually kind of disagreed with an article that Cedric had written. So I reached out to him about being on the podcast and you know he, he ended up clarifying some terminology for me and turns out he's right, of course, after all. Um, and so we, we dig into that. And we also just really dive down the rabbit hole of understanding skill acquisition, understanding expert decision making, and trying to work through a few different problems to apply that to coaching to apply that to management, and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in practical expertise and skill acquisition, you should well listen to this podcast and then also check out Cedric's blog at commoncog.com. And there will be links to some of the recommended series that he's written in the show notes as well. Enjoy. All right. So Cedric, I recently shared one of your articles in my newsletter and I argued against you. So we're going to start this podcast off with a violent disagreement as <laughs> is known to, you know, rack up the, the downloads and the likes in 2020. We're going to get extremely <laughs> tribal here because you are on the tacit knowledge tribe and I guess for these purposes, I'm in the deliberate practice tribe since you said that mm. tacit knowledge is more important than deliberate practice. Mm. And so tell, tell me, tell me about your tribe. Tell me about your tacit knowledge <laughs> tribe. I, lo I love that you started with the word tribe, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is like a bad word in, in all circles. Yeah. Um, so the, the piece, uh, maybe you should make your argument, <laughs> but, um, the piece is basically, uh, uh it stemmed out of um, me noticing that deliberate practice is really difficult to put into practice. Um, and there, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, the main reason is that um, Anders Ericsson, uh, who, who came up with the, the term deliberate practice, and perhaps we should define it at the top of the podcast so your yeah. listeners know what it is. Deliberate practice is a technical term. It, is, it doesn't mean practicing while deliberately thinking about it. Um, it has a number of properties. So um, the reason why we, it's, we're interested in de deliberate practice is because it is the most established, uh, best way to find expertise known to man currently in, in the scientific literature. Um, and there are a number of properties. And if I can remember correctly, I'm going to take a look at my notes. Um, it needs to be done in a field with well-established training techniques, which means sufficient pedagogical development. Um, second, you have to be taught at the initial stages by a teacher and a, or a coach. Um, and, you know, you may change teachers and coaches depending on your level as you progress. Uh, third, uh, it requires you to acquire effective mental representations for your skill and uh, which mental representation you uh, should acquire at your current level is really determined by the coach, which is why it's, the coach is necessary. And the, and and the fourth thing is that like it always requires building or modifying previously acquired skills, perhaps by, you know, focusing on some sub aspect of that skill, which again, you can't do if you don't have sufficient pedagogical development in your field. Um, and so many people, many self-help writers and bloggers would say, you know, do deliberate Qu practice. Qu quick interruption yes. on the, the definition. And, right. and I could be incorrect on this. Doesn't it also require that you are constantly attempting to perform a skill oh, yes. at the very edge of your capacity as well? Uh, that is also true. But uh, so the way... So we need to go into a bit of history with this. Um, so Anders Ericsson actually has not had... Uh, uh, the definition I'm using is the definition from his popular science book, 
peak because I assume that like that was quite late in his career that he published that. And secondly, um, he uh, what do you call it? If he whittled it down to those number of points for a popular science book, I mean, I'll take the man at his word, right? But historically, he's actually been very difficult to pin down his actual definition of mm. of um, um, deliberate practice. Uh, and I, I, I cataloged that in one of my blog posts. I think I called it the problems with deliberate practice. Uh, and I linked to a number of other uh, pedagogy or like learning science researchers who pointed this out. And there, there are out, lots of critiques out there. Um, and this definition, you're right. So he says that deliberate practice there is purposeful practice and deliberate practice. And purposeful practice is what you do uh, 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 that isn't as good as deliberate practice. And de- deliberate practice is everything in purposeful practice plus those properties that I talked about. So purposeful practice is you have to be focused. It must take you out of your comfort zone. It must feel very painful to do so. Um, it requires feedback and it has well-defined specific goals, right? But that's not enough. Deliberate practice is all the other extra stuff which I just mentioned at the top of this podcast. Um, and my problem with that is that for most of us, we don't live or work in careers or fields with a well-established um, pedagogical history, right? And so it's very difficult to do deliberate practice when you don't have established pedagogical uh, history and you can't find a coach who can then use that established pedagogical history to help you. Now, I do think that... So in strength training, I assume there is sufficient pedagogical development, and I think you can do deliberate practice. Can you um, sort of, is, am I right? Yeah. So, so kind of, I, I do think that you probably could do that with, let's say, technique in certain mm. lifts, right? So if you take weightlifting as an example, so like mm. snatch and clean and jerk, that, that would probably meet all those definitions where, you know, there's, I mean, there's arguments amongst strength coaches as to what's appropriate or inappropriate, but you, you could say, yes, there's established pedagogical practice. Um, there's clear outcomes, right? It's very easy to sort of, you know, do something in front of a coach and get immediate feedback. Uh, But I will say that something, at least in my field that irritates me, is Mm. people will talk about deliberate practice a bunch because it's a, a... a very it's a meme, me- <laughs> yeah, it's a very memeable concept, and you know I think that that in a lot of areas where deliberate practice is extremely important, uh, a lot of the things that you're talking about are the separators between people, right? The ability to recognize patterns and execute mm. on those patterns, and to you know accomplish some sort of neurological skill at either a faster pace or whatever than someone else or more accurately or more consistently than someone else. And like that matters in strength training, but in reality, oftentimes what, what really matters isn't so much your like proficiency with the skill. It's like the Mm. contractile potential of your nervous system and your musculature, right? Or in an endurance (laughs) sport, it's like, you know, you, you just have the, the cardiovascular system of some sort of Norse God and you can just deliver more (laughs) oxygen to your muscles. And like, you can actually have terrible technique and you would probably still be extremely good and beat almost everyone. And like maybe that little last edge you, deliberate practice on your form matters, but like it's not typically the, the, the thing that separates people, let's say. Right. I think the thing that leapt out at me was, um, is there enough pedagogical development in, in, it does sound that there is sufficient pedagogical development in your field, right? Um, you can contrast this with say management, uh, I, I think, I don't know why it's been around for so long. Uh, most management books aren't about managing people. They're about managing businesses, right? Uh, and and, and I, I would really like to see like a good basic syllabus um, for beginner managers. And I think some of them do exist, like Manager Tools, for example, which uh, you've, you've had somebody from Manager Tools on your podcast before. I believe that they do provide a very good basic uh, uh, syllabus. But... I don't think the level of pedagogical development in management is if you compare it to chess, for example, right, or tennis. Um, they coaches in tennis or professional tennis or professional chess can break down sub skills. They can watch your game and say, okay, so this particular thing you need to be careful for X, Y, Z. Let's create a bunch of practice sessions around X and then Y and then Z, and then we put them together and we'll see if you do better. All right? You don't really have this with managers in large scale, you need to get good executive coaches, but then they tend to be idiosyncratic uh, almost uh, with their own approaches, right? And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And and so you can say in a field like this that the level of pedagogical development in management is much um, more uh, 
uh, it's less developed. And so therefore, if you want to improve, you can't use deliberate practice here. You need something else. And, and, and that something else uh, led me down a rabbit hole. Uh, and I realized that um, what I'm, I, I tr- I'm truly, what, what I think is more useful to mine uh, is a, in the, the proper academic name for it is the naturalistic decision-making field of research, right? That one, that field of research, their entire shtick is um, they look at experts, they explicate the expertise that they have, even when the expert is not able to explain what they do or how they do what they do. And then they turn those into training programs. And they're primarily used by the military. They're primarily used by highly technical industries like nuclear power plants, um, who, you know, want to extract sort of what's the skill that these some of these operators have when they're diagnosing problems in a nuclear power plant, and then try to turn that into better user interfaces or better training programs. Um, and I, the entire taxit knowledge versus deliberate practice series talks to this tension. I just package it in taxit knowledge as taxit knowledge because I've tried many times to explain to friends the nature of this obsession. And every time I try to explain, they roll their eyes back to the back of their heads every time I say naturalistic decision making because it's not so stupid, so boring, right? And then I finally say, you know, I, I, I was like, have you ever started in a job? Maybe it's programming. Maybe it's you know design, whatever. And then you see a senior um, uh, who who is you know uh, your boss or whatever, and he produces work that you want. He or she produces work that you want to have. And then you ask yourself, what does he or she have in their head that I don't? How can I learn that? When you're asking that question, deliberate practice is not going to help you because there's no pedagogical skill involved. It's taxed knowledge that you're after, and therefore uh, that's why you need to start looking into this field of research. So that's the entire sort of the trust of the series. And then I go into like, what are the main findings from this uh, research literature? And and then uh, how do you actually use it or how I found ways to sort of apply it to my personal practice? Yeah, totally. And 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 the I guess the thrust of my disagreement with yeah. the, at least the article that I originally wrote about was more that um, something resembling delib- something resembling deliberate practice is probably one of the best ways to actually gain that tacit knowledge. Right. That if you, th- if, if you think about the, we, we can, we can use software development as an example, right? Cause that's something that you're an, yep. an accomplished professional in. And yep. I'm sort of like a, like an intermediate hack job person who can get some stuff done in a way that would probably, you know, my, my, my Git habits would make you vomit. Right. My, 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 my version control is terrible. Like, but I can sort of like piece some stuff together. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I, an example that I use is, uh, uh, an extremely important tacit skill to developing as a software developer is being able to Google your errors and your problems yes. in a way that gets you a usable answer. Yes. Right. That that's probably one of the most important things that's extremely difficult to say exactly how you do it. But once you figure it out, you can kind of just like start solving your own problems and you sort of hit like an escape velocity of like, oh, okay, I have an intuition for what's going wrong. I have an intuition as to which stack overflow thread is going to make any sense. You know, I can tell that this guy's answer is kind of a bad one and I'm not going to use it. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, like all those things are are exactly what you're, yeah, all these things are what you're talking about as far as like, there's not an established pedagogical tradition and it's sort of difficult to, um, you know, put that into a formal practice framework. Mm. But that said, if you, if you look at something like coding in a deliberate practice way where it's like, okay, you know, there's not an established tradition, but if you're working on the edge of your ability and getting immediate feedback based upon whether or not your code compiles or not, or having potentially a senior developer look at it and tell you if it makes any sense, that's probably one of the best ways to to build that framework for like, how do I Google my errors and how do I develop an intuition for debugging something that's going wrong? Right. So, um, so I know this is going to sound very wonky and, and uh, nitpicky, but uh, that what you just described, Ericsson calls it purposeful practice. It's not sure. deliberate practice. Deliberate practice has to have all those additional things. It has to be in a field with adequate pedagogical development. It has to be with a coach. It, the coach will specify sub skills that you're uh, bad at and break down your, what you're exi- what you're already doing. Right. So what he what what you're describing is purposeful practice. And Ericsson sort of does a cop out. I think in the the late latter half, of the the last final third of the book, he's like, oh yeah, you know, you can't actually do deliberate practice for many things, but you can use the <laughs> principles of deliberate practice to get better. Right. And what he yeah, actually totally. means is like you get you use purposeful practice. Practice. Um, 
and I'm not I'm not saying that like deliberate practice is, is useless. It is the most effective way we know right now uh, to get good at things. It just also happens to be the most. It, it also happens to be that way because it is it uh, it's easy to study skill development in fields with high pedagogical development, right? And so therefore, yeah. of course, Ericsson went and started studying that first. It's like if you're looking for something, of course, you go to the the illuminated parts of the terrain first, right? But for most of us, we don't live in a in, in illuminated terrains. So the other way that I think about this is that, yes, you do need some form of purposeful practice, which is focus, edge of your ability, feels painful, has clear specific goals, right? And sub goals. Um, but the real question there is that why is it some one person who is good at, who does purposeful practice is more, uh, you know, advances much faster than another person who does purposeful practice? And, and, and the answer to that is that they have a nose for... Uh, they have a nose for what skill to next learn, right? And and that that nose is what I'm trying to capture. Because when you're in a field with no pedagogical development, guess who has to do the pedagogical development? You do, right? So you need to figure out by just watching practitioners at work how to come up with, with like a, a skill tree or a set of skills in which order for yourself to go train, right? And that's the missing piece. That's what makes it really difficult to get good if you're in, say, management or software engineering, software programming uh, or design or so on and so forth. Yeah, I think I think there's also an important um, idea about a, a, a wicked versus a kind learning environment. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. That, that 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 probably also dictates how much of an established pedagog pedagogical tradition you can even have in the first place. That right. So if you're in true. if you're, if you're in a wicked environment, meaning essentially that the the feedback on your outcome is loosely coupled with your actual, let's say, decision making or skill. Right. So that, um, you know, one can think of uh, uh, what would be a great example of like a, an awfully investing. wicked learning, investing, starting a small business. Um, no, no, no. You know. Starting a small business is not. It's a mix. Yeah, they're sure. wicked and they're a kind. It's a what do you call yeah, it? it? Yeah. Yeah. De depending on exactly how you define it. Right. And, 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 and what you're actually what you're actually trying to do with your business. Right. That that could be like a wicked more oh, or less yeah. wicked. But but yeah. but essentially, the, the idea is that you can do everything right in a wicked learning environment and still actually have a bad outcome. Yes. Right. That, that that you can you know investing, you can make appropriate calculations of risk, and you know try to try to do everything the best way possible, and some massive market shift could just come and wipe you out. And yes, that you know sure. yeah. that that the feedback from your decision making process isn't necessarily tightly coupled with how good of a job you did. Right. Yes. Whereas if you, uh, I think actually one of Erickson's studies was on uh, people memorizing a string of digits. Yes. Right. And that that's that's a, a a very kind learning environment because basically you either memorize the digits or you don't. Right. You can't memorize the digits and then say them back and it's like oh surprise like the world suddenly converted from base ten to base yep, twelve yep, and you're yep, wrong yep, yep, like yep. it just doesn't happen. <laughs> so, and so um, two things there. So. First, this is sort of a tangent, but not really, but sort of jumping into your example of the the, 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 the guy doing numbers. Um, that's actually really early in his career, right? Uh, even before he did studies on musicians, right, and athletes, um, he started out with the whole memorizing thing. And what strikes me about that is that, um, so when he began, there was zero pedagogical development in the field. And in the book, he sort of makes this throwaway comment, right? In, in Peak, he was like, as the years passed, uh, uh, the, the, the people who were more successful passed on their tricks to other people who then developed it further. And so, and then at some point, somebody hit on the idea to do memory palaces. And now these people can do like 10 times, 20 times, or like, I don't know, some ridiculous order magnitude difference in num numbers of digits uh, memorized than when he first started in the 70s research looking into this, right? And so he basically saw a few uh, have pedagogical development, which makes deliberate practice more possible. But I'm surprised he didn't write about like, okay, how do you actually figure out, right? Like, uh, uh, how do you explicate and come up with the taxid skills and the tricks that then later resulted in this very smooth, like, you know, the way has already been paved. And if you want to do deliberate practice, there are existing memory coaches who have benefited from these multi-generations of people experimenting and passing on skills. 
Um, I wish he'd written more about that. I know he's aware of uh, the people in the NDM community that, uh, who have worked on it because he was an editor of the uh, Cambridge Handbook of Expertise and Expert uh, Performance, and many of the NDM researchers contributed to that. Um, but I, my conclusion is that deliberate practice as a subfield of academia, you can't find much material on exactly this thing, which matters to most of us uh, as practitioners in our careers where we don't work in, in areas with like good pedagogical development. So that's like, th that's one thing. Um, I'm just really curious that that's the case. And it was really neat to see you bringing it up as well. Um, to go back to the uh, kind versus wicked learning environment. So this idea is, I think it was in the 80s by Robin Hogarth, 80s or 90s. Uh, uh, Robin Horga Hogarth and his team, and it was popularized in uh, David Epstein's range, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it was also actually heavily referenced in uh, Kahneman and Klein's uh, paper on the limits of expertise, right? So NDM, which Gary Klein was a founder of, and, and the whole uh, cognitive biases and heuristics tradition, which Kahneman obviously was one of the founding members of, um, uh, client studies areas in which expertise is possible. So firefighters, marine fire squad commanders, uh, soldiers who are able to recognize IEDs, um, technicians in nuclear power plants or in air forces that can you know can can sort of understand. Uh, they see one hole in the side of the plane, they immediately know. Okay, this is gonna take like three months. And you ask like, how do you know? And then they explain, oh, we could model like how the plane works internally. We know that this hole must mean that. Anyway, um, so Klein and Kahneman came together and they wrote this incredibly readable paper. Uh, I think it's called A Failure to Disagree. I highly recommend reading it. And they basically say that you can actually tell if a field uh, uh, lends itself to expertise development, which means an NDM approach slash deliberate practice approach slash practice approach uh, would work versus a, a domain where it might not work. And, and perhaps I should pull that up somewhere. I think it's in one of my... Okay, there it is. Uh, nice thing about having your blog post summarize these things. So they said that expertise is not found in stockbrokers, clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, college admission officers, court judges, personnel selectors, intelligence analysts, and expertise is found in livestock judges, astronomers, test pilots, soil judges, chess masters, physicists, right? And, and the I, I, if I'm not mistaken, this paper took them a few years to write, um, but they boiled it down to two things. You need two things to have expertise. Um, and the two things are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the first thing is, um, what was it? You have uh, sufficient feedback from the environment. And uh, and by the way, a probabilistic, high probabilistic environment doesn't necessarily, like poker, for example, right? You don't get perfect feedback, but you do get some feedback. And over time, you sort of can uh, predict. Um, uh, and, 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 and then the flip side of that is, I mean, the, the, second, the second thing is that, um, oh dear, I can't remember this now. Uh, uh, let's see. Yes, so it's um, sufficient feedback and regularities in the environment. So they call it like regularities, meaning that like the patterns that you seek actually do are real patterns. They're not something that would change uh, overnight. And people would disagree with uh, what they say about like, uh, I, th I think there, there are um, sort of, there is a middle ground between these two extremes. Uh, poker players is sort of like not so wicked, not so kind. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, and then it also stock investing or like, you know, uh, the, the business of investing in general uh, also lies in this sort of middle ground. Um, I'm not fully... So I, I what I don't what I'm not very good at and what I don't know much about is training methods in those domains, uh, those sort of like stock investing, because I, I have no experience investing. Um, my experience running a business, uh, doing programming, a lot of these are middle ground things. So uh, some parts of it is difficult, like when you're sort of competing against competitors, that's sort of dealing with more uncertainty. But then a lot of parts of running a business, like, you know, getting good at managing people, evaluating people, hiring people, right? Doing uh, rigorous trial and error when to, to sort of figure out like, hey, is this program going to work? Oh, sorry, I mean, if this is this sales, is this product going to work? Is this marketing technique going to work, right? That's in the middle ground, I believe. Like it's actually possible to get better at it. Sorry, I've gone on for a bit there, but uh, just to sort of talk to that, I, I am 
really interested in uh, investigating further. And I do believe there's actually a rich literature around uh, how to get good at investing. Um, I've been sort of reading for the past two years, but I'm by no means like an expert in any of that. Yeah, totally. And and, and I think that, um, that, that this idea of most of the skills that people actually want to develop in a lot of real world scenarios, not fitting into the, the sort of um, mythologized deliberate practice framework yeah. is... Uh, an important and profound insight that I think a lot of people probably kind of know that without necessarily articulating it as a, as a piece of tacit knowledge, let's say, <laughs> right. But that, but that a lot of folks are trying to get better at things, you know, I mean, in, in your blog, you're talking a lot about improving in, in your career um, by reading stuff about deliberate practice that's applicable to someone who wants to be, you know, a violin soloist. And it's not necessarily mm. applicable to someone who wants to be able to, you know, do solid customer research research interviews and uh, manage a, a like a product development team, right? That those are yeah. just like pretty pretty different in terms of how you actually acquire the skills that are important to do that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, what 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 should people do? I mean, we, we've right. sort of danced around it a little bit, but okay. what what do people do? So, uh, let's talk about the, the 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 series, like the the actual content of the series. So, taxit knowledge. Uh, we should probably start with definitions so that people don't get confused. Taxit knowledge is knowledge that cannot be easily put into words. Um, this is a very lousy definition. Uh, in fact, later in the series, uh, I, I, I break it down further and use like proper definitions from philosophy, which I was very reluctant to do because philosophy isn't immediately useful most of the time. Uh, but enough people were confused about it. And so taxon knowledge is really like what, uh, knowledge that's very difficult to describe. And uh, most of uh, expertise, if, if you see expertise in sort of um, fields with, you know, this sort of master-apprentice relationship, what's really happening is that the apprentice is uh, gaining the taxon knowledge from the master. And the way they do that is through simulation, through copying, through osmosis, not through some explicated uh, practice program or uh, some you know, uh, explicit pedagogical development. Um, now, I don't want to get into the weeds first, but let me just like sort of lay out uh, uh, what, what, I'm, uh, what the series is interested in before we can get into like some of the definitional uh, problems with this. Um, so the series is interested in how, when you are in a situation where you see somebody in your you know, circle of uh, friends or your network who is better at you at something, how do you go and gain their expertise, right? And why I say that NDM is quite useful for this is because it's their entire thing. Uh, the way that most NDM researchers work is they work with a framework of expertise or expert intuition. Now, expert intuition sounds like it's, you know, terrible, like you can't explicate it. You, if you ask a tennis player, how do you do that? They've said, oh, you know, it just felt right. And I just did it, right? They can't explain it to you. But what the NDM researchers found over the last three decades, four decades, is that it is actually possible to extract what they do. And what you need to understand is that all of human expertise is split into, uh, they call it the recognition prime decision-making model, but it's really a model for taxid expertise. So when you look at a uh, when an expert looks at a developing situation, their brain automatically recognizes it, recognizes it as, a, as an instance of a prototype in their heads, and they generate four things. They generate expectancies, which is expectations of what's going to happen next. They generate a bunch of cues to watch and notice. Um, they generate a bunch of goals, so a prioritized list of things to think about, and they generate an action script, what to do in response to this prototype. So I'll give you an example. Um, when you're driving a car, in the beginning, it was overwhelming. You know, there was like, you, you don't really know where to look. Uh, there are so many knobs, and your steering wheel and your pedals. Um, but if once you're good at driving, right, when you're driving, you know you have, expectant you have expectancies, you know uh, in certain situations that when you're turning, um, you need to put a signal, you, you know you should be watching for cars coming from the opposite direction. Uh, you focus on specific cues in your environment to tell you, you know, if you need to change your behavior, you have an action script for executing the turn and you have goals. You know what to worry about, you know to check your mirror to make sure nobody's, you know, coming up behind you, you know to check for motorbikes, you know to check for bicycles. Um, and all of these does it, it happens immediately. And the reason it happens immediately is because all of these operation, operations happen in implicit memory. And implicit memory is the part of your brain that does face recognition, right? When, when a friend of yours walks into the room, you don't uh, think like, you know, you don't sort of do a step-by-step -step matching of the person's face. You immediately I mean, know, oh, I recognize Maybe him. you don't. 
<laughs> no, I think implicit memory operations and facial rec- well, there's like some interesting research about like damage to the brain and what this does to facial recognition. But by and large, implicit memory operations is like a very well known <laughs> thing. It's it's the names that you have a problem with because that's a different part of your brain <laughs> from the implicit memory uh, facial recognition piece. Um, so this explains why experts are not able to explain like why they did certain certain things, right? If you if when I ask, I remember I remember being very frustrated when I was early in my career as a programmer, and I would ask like a senior programmer, like, how do you know to come up with this structure or you know this this way that I wrote the function was bad? And he was like, no, it just felt bad, right? And the reason it felt bad was because he was generating all of these properties in his implicit memory, which is as quickly as facial recognition. And you can't explain how you can recognize a face the same way that, you know, because it's that part of the brain that just works. Uh, I think it's called recognition versus recall. Recall is the explicit portion of our memory. Um, so once you have this framework, the recognition prime decision-making model, you now have some structure to try and, and probe and ask uh, how the expert does what he or she does. And the way the naturalistic decision makers, uh, the researchers do it, is they do something called uh, cognitive task analysis. They ask you to describe a very difficult case, like maybe a soldier recognizes an IED instantly and says, okay, let's not go there, right? And they ask, what happened first? What do you notice first? Then what happened? Then what happened? And then they go through in linear time order what cues and expectancies and goals and action scripts were generated at each point. And eventually, after they do enough of these uh, uh, interviews, and I'm, I'm describing an actual case, by the way, uh, IED uh, detection as a skill, they then explicate are, they manage to explicate this according to the RPD model, and then they come up with a training program to train uh, new soldiers coming to the field. So the way they did this for, I think this was Marines, no, it's infantry. Uh, it's one of the NDM podcasts. It was uh, they were interviewing a researcher who came up with this program. What the way they did it in the end was, um, they created a computer game to train uh, all soldiers who would be deployed to such, to such areas. And in the computer game, you're playing as a terrorist. Right? Your job is to put down an IED because they realized that the main mental model that uh, these soldiers had was they were able to put themselves in the terrorist, I mean, not terrorists, uh, the insurgents' shoes, right? And and then they could use that as to, to, to guide their expectancies, their cues and their action scripts and their goals. Um, and, and the program has been so, really so almost on like a on like a zoomed out level, the yeah. the skill is being able to to properly imagine what the adversary yes. would be trying to do from yes. a strategic perspective. That's fascinating. Yes, and then they now every soldier, uh, if I'm not mistaken, every American soldier who goes, uh, I, I think it's Afghanistan, has to go through this uh, module where they're playing this video game. Yeah. Yeah. So question in terms of like actually extracting this knowledge from people in a situation like that uh like like recognizing an ied threat let's say mm. that's something that's more of a clear like that you you can probably think that through sort of like you're saying from like a decision making perspective like what did you notice mm. first what did you notice second you know what when did you start to get on easy and and actually mm. get those those questions answered from someone i guess i'm curious if that if that research has been or those techniques have been applied to something like let's say let's say sport right i know you have a, a judo background right and i have a, a soccer background and, you know, I mean, sort of like you were saying, if you ask someone who's good what they're doing, they often give you a terrible answer. They don't really know what they're doing, right? That, that, yep. they're, that they're able to, you know, see some sort of pattern in the field of play that other people just aren't able to see. And they're able to kind of like, you know, in judo or, or soccer as well, you know, perceive like subtle weight shifts in their opponent and capitalize them, capitalize on them in a way that other people who aren't as good can't. And I'm curious yep. if, if they're able to, you know, through that series of questioning actually extract models from athletes who are doing things in a very fast way, um, you know, and get something useful out of it. Oh, yes, definitely. So one reason why I, I love listening to the NDM podcast is because um, when they get researchers to come on and then talk about like the actual interventions and training programs they've come up with, right, that sort of adds to your prototypes as a person who is interested in creating training programs for yourself. Um, uh I'll give you just one example, man. And this is totally applicable to 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 sports. Uh, 
and I, I will note that in, in the past, before the NDM community existed, I think many coaches were doing this intuitively. And we would say, oh, he was a great coach, right? He, he could explicate all these hidden things. And basically, these coaches, what they had in their heads, maybe not a proper f- model of RPD, but they were intuitively figuring out what their players noticed and then turning those into training programs for other people who came down after the, I mean, after the player went off, you know, new players come in, they want to sort of replicate this. Um, I, I believe good coaches have some sort of mental model in their head that does something similar to what the RPD people are doing. Um, I'm sorry, the NDM people who use RPD. Uh, recognition, prime decision making. Sorry, I'm using a lot of abbreviations here because I spent too much time looking to the literature. Um, sorry. Um, so one example, um, there's this fascinating episode where one of the researchers, what he did was he was trying to figure out how professional tennis players could immediately tell uh, the serve type from the opponent, right? And to be fair, the way he did that, did it is it's 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 quite impossible for somebody like us to do uh, because the way he did it was he showed them a video of uh, people uh, executing a swerve and the first thing he did was he started cutting it off right so like maybe after 100 milliseconds into uh, a, a serve uh, he cuts it off and then he sort of reduces the amount of time okay maybe he shows the full video first and he cuts off 100 milliseconds then 200 milliseconds and then eventually he gets to the point where the person can no longer tell the pro can no longer tell uh whether the person is executing a backhand a forehand whatever there are three types of serves if i remember correctly in tennis um okay so then they know at what's the minimum amount of time for the brain to immediately recognize that this is x serve then the next step they did, they, they, they did was they began blacking out parts of the body <laughs> to see if the expert, the pro mm. tennis players could still recognize the serve uh, given that amount of like how many milliseconds. Um, and, the, and, and for many of these uh, uh, pro athletes, they can recognize and have no idea how they recognize. But after blacking out various parts, they realize, you know, they black out the hands, the pro's performance didn't suffer at all. And then they black out the waist and the legs. And then suddenly, you know, the pro's performance dipped to exactly the same as an amateur. And then they knew that whatever pattern the brain, the, the pro's brains were picking up were below the, the belt, literally, like the waist and the, the, the balance. Um, and so now, once they could explicate that, then they could like oh sorry, they could start doing research into um, how, uh, what, actual cues they notice and then turn that into a training program for amateurs. So I've silenced my phone. Right. So I think this is using the RPD model with some creativity around how do you actually extract these fast moving cues, right, from, from things that happen in a split second. Um, and it's, 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 I think it's a marvelous example of like, I, I don't know what you, how you might apply that to soccer, but I can, I think you can probably think of some possible experiments there's actually a pretty excellent video on YouTube doing essentially the same thing with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and a corner kick oh, where they have someone take a corner awesome. kick and turn the lights out right after they kick it. And he's still able to score, right? He's still able to, oh, to run and head the ball in. It's, it's fascinating. Oh man. And I think um, for my sport, judo, which is incredibly technical, right? Uh, you don't really know uh, if, uh, uh, how a player is doing what they're doing because there's so many variables involved, uh, right? And and I believe that judo's pedagogical development is actually really bad. And I wonder as well, looking into this research, what it would look like if they applied it to judo because there's so many techniques, there's so many variations and the meta keeps changing. Um, so I, I, I really hope somebody that takes the NDM research and applies it um, to my sport. Yeah, well, I mean, and there's the there's the tacit knowledge of being able to figure out how to design the studies in order to even yes. find out what experts are doing, right? <laughs> I mean, yes. you know, my my intuition as someone who has never done anything even resembling judo is probably that the the most important thing would be having like a an incredible intuitive sense of like weight shifting, right? Is that is that accurate? The, right, that you can like feel what someone is potentially doing or trying to do and and capitalize on it. Uh, that that is true. Um, um, probably more true in the seventies than it is today, uh, because uh, a huge part of judo now is, um, I mean, it's still true, but a huge part of judo now is a grip fighting. So getting a good grip, and the person who gets the better grip, um, denies the opponent from getting a good mm. grip. So basically, the opponent has no chance of throwing uh, you because they have no hands on your gi, right, on your body. 
So a huge part of the meta game now is shifted to grip fighting, and um, uh, the I I the, I'm not very good at grip fighting. <laughs> I will be honest here, and so like for me, um, I'm really interested in figuring out what the experts do uh, to be good at grip fighting. And um, I, I I regularly talk to a coach in, in Malaysia, uh, the only Malaysian to have played in the World Championships. And he, he's a pretty good, like he, is, he, he has pedagogical instincts that I think most coaches do not have, even internationally, right? He's able to explicate things uh, that other coaches sort of like, they know, but then they can't talk about. And he says that grip fighting is particularly... Uh, uh, interesting because the Americans actually explicated it years ago, but they nobody ever put it into video. Nobody ever wrote about it. It's sort of been passed on. There are a bunch of principles of grip fighting that everybody from Jimmy Pedro uh, knows. You know, Mike Swain knows. All the U.S. Uh, the great U.S. judokas knows. Um, I don't know. I don't think any other country explica- has explicated it, although they know how to teach it. In Japan in particular, they don't explicate the principles at all. They just sort of like, you just fight enough and eventually you pick it up by osmosis. Um, and so his, his whole thing is like, that. that's really stupid. You shouldn't try to leave to osmosis what you can explicate and teach. And perhaps that speaks to one aspect of our discussion so far, which is that um, the goal of every uh, uh, training program is to try to take what is taxed and turn it into explicit knowledge because then you can sort of bring in more deliberate practice like techniques and then you can be more effective yeah and 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 not even necessarily having to make it um, fully explicit but even being able to get someone to focus on the right thing right because uh, uh, you know I I have a, let's say some level of expertise in fitness coaching right enough to recognize other coaches making a lot of mistakes in Ooh. terms of how they're coaching someone and what they're focusing on and to, to kind of, you know, apply some of the principles of what you've talked about. Typically the things that other coaches are doing wrong when they're coaching someone is they either fail to recognize what I would consider to be an obvious prototype that you've mentioned, right? That if you have enough experience, it's like, I've seen this movie before. This mm. is what this person's Almost certainly this is what their problem is. And I'm going to start working with that and seeing if it's, you know, confirmed or disconfirmed. And then also prioritizing things incorrectly. Right. So, so, you know, if I see someone making a mistake in coaching, I see them not recognizing a pattern that to me is obvious Mm. and or focusing on something that may be correct, but is, you know, priority number seven rather than priority Priority number number one. one. Right. right. And so, so the, by, yeah, by, by being able to make some of that tacit knowledge explicit, yes. you're able to get people to then say, oh, maybe this is the most important thing and I should focus on this and make sure that this is handled before focusing on these other things instead. Yes. Um, I want to, I want to, I think that's a beautiful example. I've had similar experiences when I'm teaching management to uh, newer managers, right? I see them not recognizing a prototype and then doing exactly the wrong thing and sort of to, uh, explain further like how you can make RPD work for you. Um, so step one is you explain the prototype and then you explain the expectancies and cues you noticed uh, uh, you, as a story. Um, because if you explain it like in, in theory, it doesn't sound, uh, it isn't, it, human brains are not made to 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 grok that as well as they do stories so what i find is like okay i tell them a, a idealized example of the prototype in my past and i highlight certain things that i noticed and then uh and then i say okay now you go try this action script that i have expressed to you through my story and then they come back and usually the results are better and then i don't because this is a learning moment right i don't want to waste the learning moment so then i say okay now you've had this experience, you know it works, you recognize the prototype probably forever because, you know, that's how human learning works. Um, now, what happens if you notice this? And I'll change some property of the story, right? Which changes the expectancies, which changes the cues. Uh, and, and then I'll say, like, well, what would you do? And then we sort of simulate, like, what's going to happen uh, if he does something different, right? So, uh, so to make this more of a story, do you have an example of, of, a, of something sure. that you would change? Sure. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll give you an example uh, of uh, an actual management uh, coach coaching session that I did. Um, so this particular manager, uh, he had a problem with admitting that he was wrong. 
Um, and when you're managing really smart programmers, especially if the programmers are better than you, which should be the case if you're hiring well, uh, this is very bad. <laughs> um, so he, he had problems admitting he was wrong. He also had problems admitting he didn't know, which be- caused lots of problems. Well, first of all, because uh, if you don't know and you believe that it's the job of the manager to tell the programmer what to do, then everybody bot- bottlenecks on you because you are the one who investigates and figure out, figures out the right thing to, to build, right? And then goes to the programmer and tells them that. And you also lose the respect of your programmers um, who are really smart, right? So I recognized the prototype and then I said like, okay, so um, one problem that you seem to have is you are terrified of looking or of, of you know, seeming less awesome as a pro, you know, less accomplished as a programmer compared to some of your subordinates. And then I told the story of how I worked with um, uh, my technical lead at the time, who he also respected because he, the technical lead was still at the company, just that the technical lead was busy uh, working on another po- another set of things, so we don't uh, talk as often. Um, uh, or rather, he didn't. My, this 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 particular manager didn't talk as much as this technical lead. But the technical lead was really really good. And I I, I just basically said so. When I came in, I basically uh, re- recognized immediately that he was the better programmer. And so when I was making, uh, we were making decisions on technical choices. I would say I don't know, and then let's figure this out together. Right, and he didn't disrespect me. Um, he understood that I also had a part to play in this. I could help him with a lot of other things that he didn't have to worry about. And so we worked it out together. And it turned, and he turned out to be right. His solution turned out to be right. Right. So then I then I said, uh, and what's working here is that when you're working with really smart programmers, they will respect you if you admit that you don't know, and then you work together to find a solution. Now go try that next week. My challenge to you is you should say I don't know at least once. <laughs> <laughs> and he did he went out he said I don't know he, fe- he said it felt amazing um, um, and then they worked on a solution together they could find a solution and he, he came back the, ne- uh, the week after when we had our next session and I was like okay how do you go he said it's, it's great he said alright so now here's a follow up scenario you have a new guy and the new guy you hire just this new guy and this, this young whippersnapper thinks that he's the best programmer in the world <laughs> what do you do <laughs> when he proposes something and you don't know what to do but you know that his solution sucks. But you don't know what the, what's the right thing to do. How do you handle this? And then we ro- role played for a bit, right? And what I was trying to do was I was trying to prime him for that situation, which will inevitably pop up because I know it will inevitably pop up, and and, and uh, sort of give him an extra prototype. So when it, the time actually comes, right, he just has to unfurl the story in his head, which then generates the expectancies, goals, cues, blah blah blah. Yeah, I think that's a great example as well because, um, you know, if, if you think in terms of things like prototypes, that can make some of the the dichotomies and confusing, conflicting advice given in a lot of management, business, et cetera, actually make a lot of sense, yeah. right? Because, I mean, to, to use your example, well, maybe I'm jumping the gun. What 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 should you do? I mean, I, I don't I don't I don't actually know what you should do <laughs> if you have a a young whippersnapper who comes in and has some, you know reckless wild idea that they think is the greatest thing and you're like i mean you know more about this sql database than me but you're wrong what do yeah. you do what, what should you say um so i think the other really powerful thing about this role-playing thing is that my approach could be different from his right and what's the goal what, what my goal was as a coach was to find something that was comfortable for him uh, and th- this is a slightly different challenge than uh, just say once that you don't know next week, right? Um, and so I can't remember now what, what worked for him, but the way that I would work uh, on this was um, either I would get a another uh, senior person whose opinion I respected to come in and chime in and say, uh, uh, no, this is a bad idea. Let's work on it together. But now we have three heads instead of one. And eventually like one of us will come up with something that is really, really good. And if the guy is really stubborn and he refuses uh, to accept the the obviously technically superior challenge, I mean, sorry, solution, um, then what I would do, not necessarily what my, my subordinate who is this manager would do, uh, would be to find a low risk task where he can make mistake, make a mistake and then like, you know, uh, get burned by it. And then we can come in and say like, okay, so you don't actually know that that uh, 
as much. And the reason why you got this wrong was because of X, Y, Z. Uh, and then maybe like put him under a, uh, uh, under a more senior programmer who would then be taught to teach him. And then he was like, okay, yeah, I do have some things to learn, right? But that's the way I would approach it. Uh, not necessarily how somebody else with different personalities or different like, you know, uh, communication uh, styles would do it. Um, and so I think after learning this sort of framework, it becomes a lot easier to like, my job is to give you the prototype and we will role play and you will come up with your solution, which fits your personality, your abilities better. And in, in, in before I read about RPD, I would try to shove down my solution, like what I would do in that situation to uh, my subordinate. And, and, then the, and that also doesn't necessarily help by just shoving your solution down their throat because they yes. don't then actually develop the understanding of the different kinds of prototypes so that they yep. can execute it on their own. Yep, yep, yep. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so I think, how, yeah, yeah I, I was just going to basically ask, you know, the if, you're, if your goal is to try to teach someone to recognize prototypes, right, and to develop yes. the skill set of, you know, maybe recognizing some of the prototypes that you know, and then also being able to pattern match on their own and build their own prototypes, right? I mean, how do you create an environment that enables people to do that? Oh, this is the question to ask. Um, I've So there are many, many ways. And I, I highly recommend anybody who's listening to this who is interested in this approach to go read The Power of Intuition. Um, so Gary Klein has written a number of books. Uh, the the most famous, the, the 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 first one was Sources of Power, where he explained uh, in great detail the NDM approach to things and the recognition prime decision making model. And it is the 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 original book from which Malcolm Gladwell took that firefighter story, who immediately had ESP right, and recognized uh, that the floor is going to cave in on his man, right? Um, but Power of Intuition is actually more useful if you're a practitioner because it contains actual uh, examples of training programs that Gary and his uh, colleagues have used and implemented in many situations, army, military, and commercial over the years. Um, and my answer to that is that there are so many uh, uh, different ways of doing that. The most basic example is, as I've mentioned, you, you tell stories to communicate prototypes instead of actually explaining what the prototype is because the human brain is optimized for stories. But then there are alternative uh, things as well. In Power of Intuition, uh, Gary talks about one consultant who designed a, a game for uh, the, the, the staff of this um, manufacturing facility who had huge problems with scheduling. And she designed a simplified form of their manufacturing process for them to play and got them to like, you know, completely fail. <laughs> Before she was like, try this. And then they were like, whoa, this, this makes things so much better. And then just that try this may, uh, allowed them to think in more and more productive ways to optimize uh, the, the, the way that they perform uh, the tasks that were very similar to the actual scheduling and, and bottlenecking and process management tasks that they were doing in the manufacturing facility. Um, so my recommendation is just go read the book, subscribe to the podcast, and every time you hear a training program, add that to your list of prototypes. <laughs> <laughs> so meta. <laughs> but that's the um. way humans learn, right? I mean, part of the reason why the NDM community is, is so involved in um, ergonomic uh, uh, research they, they are actually called human factors or uh, human factors or like research or, or related uh, organizations, I mean, NDM is very much adjacent to that field, is because they truly believe that when you understand RPD, you're understanding how the brain actually works. And when you design training programs around this framework, you are going with the grain of the mind. You're not working against it. So uh, you're pretty much limited by your creativity. And I think it's much more fruitful to go dig this literature for working training programs or descriptions of training programs who have worked because these people have thought about this for a lot longer than you have and you can just add it to your prototypes. <laughs> totally. And, and, and I, I want to circle back to that example you gave of the manufacturing process. Or no, it was the scheduling. It wasn't the it process It was scheduling itself, and manufacturing. Correct? It was both. Okay. So there was problems yeah. with like dealing with multiple batch sizes and different orders from different clients. It's a great story. Yeah. So I, without without actually knowing the story and just hearing you retell it, I think one of the most insightful things about that is actually creating uh, like a dummy problem for people to work on so that they wanted a solution, right? Because I think that you, you've, you've mentioned a few things kind of dancing around this. And I think that that's, you know, super insightful is that people tend to want to solve problems that they know that they have, 
right? Yes. And you know, you know, you have like a sort of scheduling problem in general, but it's kind of like a messy process. I mean, sort of like we were talking about earlier, and it can be difficult to figure out what's actually going on. And if you create a a dummy problem that's a little bit simpler, and then people realize what the actual problem is, then they want a solution to that problem yes. rather than whatever they think the problem was previously. Yes. So that's that, that hits the nail right on the head. Uh, uh, the way Klein described the, the consultant's uh, sort of thinking process was she recognized that there's expert intuition around this, but they had the, and she wanted to communicate this expert intuition, like the right way of approaching or seeing the problem, but in a way that isn't a lecture. Right, and so ultimately, the game, even getting the executives and all the line managers to go and come in and play it, uh, help them grok the the mental model a lot faster. Um, and I think that requires some creativity to do that. Yeah, we um, in, in a similar type of learning process um, for our coaches meetings at my gym. I used to give a lot of lectures. I used to be mm. like, "Hey guys, I know all this stuff. Like, let me just vomit it at you." Right. And I think that it was probably somewhat interesting and people probably learned a little bit, but it was not very effective at all in terms of getting people to um, start to develop new prototypes or change coaching behavior, et cetera. And when we pivoted to much more open ended uh, meetings where it was like, hey, what's something someone has struggled with this week? Like, let's go through an example of having difficulty fixing a specific client's form or like a, maybe an interpersonal conflict with a client or, you know, a difficulty explaining a certain aspect of the program that that was orders of magnitude more effective. Um, even if I didn't think it was necessarily the most useful thing to talk about, right. It, it was a problem that people could relate to. It was a story, um, Prototype. you know, that people could understand. Right. And it was a problem that at least one person in the room actually had and wanted a solution to rather than me just sort of being like, well, here's all my ideas of what should happen. Like, yep. let me shove them at you. Yep. Yep. And you were expanding the set of prototypes in your head. You were actually doing something very similar to what Klein does with uh, Marine Fire Squads, uh, command, uh, Marine Fire Squad commanders. They would get like, you know, they, they would lay out the scenario. One of them would lay out the scenario and everybody would sort of chip in ideas on like, how do we solve this? And then they simulate it in their heads. So yeah, yeah. exactly that. That's great. This, this Klein guy sounds like he's onto something. <laughs> <laughs> he's retired. He's so onto something yeah. that he's retired, and the field yeah. is um, uh, doing well without him. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I want to tie a bunch of the stuff we've been talking about together into your uh, your sort of Chinese businessman concept, which I think is very insightful and has a bunch of applicability outside of just you know business in Southeast Asia, let's say. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, the, the idea of having this sort of expert who violates a lot of the rules that people who probably listen to podcasts like this think should be followed is fascinating, right? That, that, you know, again, people who are listening to this podcast or potentially reading your blog are probably experiencing a lot of frustration in their day to day because people who, you know, do and say a lot of wrong stuff are actually much more successful than them. And then that can create, you know, resentment or confusion or frustration about like, well, why is this person, you know, a much more effective businessman or a much more effective salesperson or a much more effective coach or whatever, when like everything they're saying is wrong, according to my knowledge from reading papers on the internet. Mm. Uh, well, where to even begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, Hmm. Yeah, I, I think so to sort of speak off your observations first, uh what you say is 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 true. I mean, we've all seen incredibly effective salespeople or business people, and then they have some theory of the world that's just incredibly wrong. Um and yet they their their results speak for themselves, right? They have repeated successes. Um if they make mistakes, they quickly learn from them. Uh I, I think the root of it is actually so the rationality community, which both of us are either adjacent to or members of, well, I, I consider myself adjacent to, although I've read them for many years, uh, um, uh, they believe that if you have accurate models of the world, you will win. And I think that's just not true. Uh, like, if you actually go out and look for examples of people who, who are winning, or like, you know, look at Oprah, for example. And this is not a new criticism, that's wrong. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, one of the members of Last Wrong uh, has 
talked about this before. Oprah holds lots of weird, wonky beliefs. And yet, if you look at her history, right, she's one of the most effective people uh, in the media business. Of course, she got lucky, but she's also really effective. She sets goals and then she gets, she goes and gets them, right? Um, and so I think the, the reason why there's this discrepancy is because in the real world, uh, you act... The way I describe it is, and this is one of the more recent blog posts, action produces information, right? So a lot of the decision-making theories or like the epistemic models of judging the world, uh, like for example, Bayesian updating, right? Requires you to sit back and and decide based on the information that you have available to you, uh, how uh, whether something is true or not, right? Um, the problem with all of these decision-making frameworks is that they come from rational choice theory, which comes from economics, which comes from, well, the, not today, it's called the field of judgment and decision-making, but it's primarily built around uh, decision experiments that are done in a situation of perfect information in a lab, right? And so, of course, all the decision-making theories and uh, frameworks that you use, whether it's, it's, it's uh, expected utility theory or it, it's um, Bayesian updating, uh, assumes that you cannot have any interaction that generates more information because you never expect a person in, ex in a decision experiment to aggressively act to generate more information. And in the real world, when you look at these people who don't have very good, what do you call it, epistemic rationality, what they do have is they have a bias to action, and they do good trial and error, and they react very quickly to the information they generate. So I, I have an example of this, which, uh, which I wrote up in the, in the blog post, uh, which is like, imagine that you, I think one example that I've seen given in multiple blog posts about Bayesian updating is you see a colleague, right, who comes in late every day, but he doesn't get scolded, whereas everybody else on the team is not allowed to come in late. And you conclude, uh, based on your priors, that there must be some political arrangement that you don't understand that, that protects this person. Uh, and, and, and then you, you know, depending on the, the number of observations and information that you get, you change your uh, hypothesis based on the priors and blah, blah, blah. But like, in reality, there's a much easier thing to do, which is to go up to him and ask, right? Um, and then you can get much better information. You don't have to do this whole busy, like, prior uh, Bayesian updating thing, uh, which takes a lot of time. Or you still do, but you at least work off much better information. And the thing that is widely known in the literature is that too much thinking is negative utility. That's the way Jonathan Barron, uh, who, who wrote Thinking and Deciding, puts it. But also none of these frameworks will ever tell you when to stop analyzing and when to start acting. Um, so with that in mind, it makes more sense now why these sort of uneducated Chinese businessmen can succeed. Because if you make sure that you are never blown up by your bets, that means you, you, know, you don't go bankrupt, um, you get to do repeated trial and errors and you respond to those repeated trial and errors, uh, and you have a bias to action which generates more information, you will likely win over the long term. Even if you have very bad epistemic models in your head and you, know, and you believe that like 4G causes cancer, 3G, 5G causes cancer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does that yeah, sort of the, answer? Um, yeah, totally. I mean, I think that, that the, the point essentially about just more rapid iteration cycles resulting in better outcomes, especially in areas based on a lot of tacit knowledge and um, developing, you know, mental prototypes of things makes a lot of sense, right? And, and that you can sort of stereotype people and, you know, you're casting some aspersions on the rationalist community and one could, you know, very reasonably do that and say, oh, these are a bunch of, you know, socially anxious nerds who are trying to like get everything right and are like afraid to do something. And so, you know, the, the iteration cycle is slow because you're trying to get each action correct. And then the sort of just like dumb uninhibited jock who just throws themselves <laughs> into the world and is like, yeah, I don't, I don't care about anything. What's going on guys. And just kind of like, throws themselves out there and learns more rapidly, right? The, from a, from a, you know, stereotypical perspective, that makes a lot of sense. And I, and I do actually think that you, um, you know, tie that into the lean startup methodology in one of your blog posts. I was like, oh, this yes. is just sort of like taking this principle and making it startup nerd friendly. Yes, exactly. Because like, 
you, if you if you're the kind of person who believes that you must have a theory behind why you're doing something, then the lean startup is perfect. It's just that, right? It sort of like explicates that and makes it um, acceptable to you. Um, I I won't go so far as to say like just do, go trash about blindly. I believe there is there is rigorous trial and error and there's non rigorous trial and error. My boss and I used to talk about this a lot. Um, like we believe that what differentiates the effective Chinese businessman and, and the effective uh, and the non-effective ones is that uh, the effective ones are a bit more they they have a bias to action but they also balance that with like okay then what did, what did I learn from that right right what did I um, what can I conclude from my experiment in in hotels <laughs> uh, and they usually have are very smart about it they will structure it in a way that if the business explodes uh, their main businesses will not be affected but they will learn a lot from doing the joint venture with some other person who perhaps has more experience uh, in hotels than they, than they do right so the, the I think the real lesson there is is it's not it's not necessarily like oh you know all all thinking is bad and all Bayesian updating is bad. Obviously, there's some value there, especially in situations where you can't affect things. Like we've seen Tadlock's research into super forecasting. I wrote a long series about that. I do believe there's value there. But in much of business, um, especially if you look at what Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett says, they 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 just don't bother forecasting about the world. Right? They say it's too difficult. It's really too difficult. And you can see that it's difficult from the way Tedlock writes about the results of his super forecasters. And so what they do instead is that they design their businesses and their lives to adapt quickly to change um, because they believe that, uh, uh, that fast adaptation to good information and fast action to generate better information is a lot more uh, tenable, tractable than doing good epistemic analysis. Yeah, totally. And and I think that the the sort of lesson of that commentary is that let's say that the the rapid iteration cycle that results in you learning about the real world and building prototypes that are useful for say business or sales or something like that are much less tightly coupled with developing a uh, let's say solid epistemological understanding yes. of the world that you can articulate, right? That that to someone who is potentially involved in something like the rationality community or academia or whatever, that they feel like those are potentially the same thing. And they're just not at all. That you can be very good at knowing about the world in a way that you can't articulate. And in fact, when you try to articulate it, it is completely incorrect. And it sounds terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then watch their actions, um, right? Like don't don't don't, yeah. don't just listen to what they say. Although I do, I do think that there's potentially another type of case there that's interesting, and, and Oprah may be an example of this, and there's certain coaches within the fitness industry that are an example of this, where what they're doing and saying is incorrect, but it serves another purpose other than accurately describing the world, right? Mm. And that people would potentially refer to that in some cases as like being political, let's say. Um, but but we can, we can I think it's, sure, the, it's right? the term that I've heard. Yeah, well, so so let, let's use Oprah as an example because I think I think this is one type of thing that's important. And so you know, Oprah's sort of like sketchy pseudoscience stuff yes. is an asset because her target market is a bunch of women who believe in sketchy pseudoscience stuff, right? And I don't think Oprah's making some sort of, you know, nefarious calculation where she's like, yes, I will convince these women to <laughs> to believe in manifesting and I will rise the TV ranks, right? Like she's not sitting there calculating that. Like she actually believes in it. But, you know, to, to her benefit, there was this entire latent market of – women who believe in pseudoscientific bullshit who are like, yes, there's finally someone like me talking about this and I relate to this person and I'm going to shower them with my attention, you know? Yep. And so it's like, it's actually an asset to be incorrect. And you know what people don't relate to is people like us talking about why yes. everyone is wrong all the time. That's yes. not yes. a relatable activity and that can actually be negative. Yes. Um, I, I, I really like, so have you read Chris Voss's uh, Never Split the Difference? I have, yeah. Yeah. And, um, one thing that leapt out at me was, so Voss, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, is a, an ex FBI hostage negotiator. And in the book, he basically sort of takes an 
takes aim at all the negotiation theory that was developed out of economic theory, uh, rational choice theory, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, best alternative to a negotiated agreement, BATNA, right? Um, so he takes aim at all that and say that that's really stupid. It doesn't really work in the real world because in the real world, you need to attack emotions first. If you attack emotions first and you manipulate, you know, the, 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 the way they, they, they feel or address the way they feel, then they will come up with their own reasoning to support the outcome that you want, right? And so the whole book, Never Split the Difference, is like all the various techniques that the FBI uses to uh, uh, control your, um, was it System 2 or System 1 responses? I think I, I always mix the two up. System 2 is the one that feels, right? Well, so, I mean, if we just take this, the title Thinking Fast and Slow, <laughs> System 1 is probably fast and System 2 is probably slow. Well, so... Right? Um, yeah, so let's just use fast and slow as, as, the, as the, the terminology. Uh, um, he, he says you target the fast system and the brain will make the slow system come up with the rationalization for why you know they, 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 uh, you should go with whatever this person is, is saying. And that probably is what Oprah's speaking to, right? She's targeting the fast system. Um, and it's not that she's wrong, it's that she gets something instrumentally true about the world that if you also get as a salesperson or as a negotiator or as a person working in a company who needs to convince their colleagues to go around, along with what you're doing, you would do well to understand as well, right? Um, so I very much don't like it when people say, you know, the world's crazy, it doesn't make sense, uh, because I think that's not very useful. Um, the more useful thing is, what does this tell me about how the world really works and why uh, am I, Why do I not have like what's necessary to figure out and exploit that to my advantage? And that I think is it's, it's what's missing um, in discussions about instrumental rationality, if you will. Yeah, totally. And um, so, so I think the Oprah example is maybe not the best to, to talk mm. about this because I think that building an audience is kind of like a, a different type of scenario, That's right? Because building an audience is much more about being relatable and making people like you than a lot of other things are. Um, and so I, I think that that maybe using the the coaching example mm, is, is kind yeah. of interesting, right? Because one would think that like, oh, it's important to be correct when you're coaching someone. Could you give an example? To, yeah, totally. So um, uh, we, we can use a CrossFit example, right? And there's a lot of coaches who talk a lot about um, mindset and, you know, just just a lot of stuff that's, you know, kind of like Oprah-esque in terms of like visualizing and believing in yourself. And, you know, it, it, it's it's not quite life coach level of like mm -hmm. fluffy, but it's mm -hmm. it's it's pretty much bullshit. And it's also um, sort of like I said before, you know, it in a lot of cases, it's like the actual thing that matters in a lot of these situations is this athlete's essentially genetic material in, <laughs> in a lot of their systems, right? And the their ability to to continuously deliver blood flow and oxygen to their working muscles. Like that matters a lot more than their, you know, like belief in themselves or their ability to have a growth mindset or their ability to like reframe challenge. Like the, not that that stuff isn't helpful, but like it's probably not the thing. Let's say. But does it um, work? Does it result in well, better so that, outcomes? Yeah, right. So that's the thing is that it, it, I would say that it does, and I would also say that the the role that it serves is something that's probably um, metaphorically true, but not literally true. If you've heard that distinction, right? Okay. Where it's not useful for an athlete to be thinking like. Oh, I don't have the genetic potential to achieve the level that I want to achieve, or that. Oh, my, you know, my calves tend to occlude when I do a certain amount of contractions, which restricts blood flow in this area, and my getting pooling, and it's reducing the amount of, you know, usable oxygen, and so I'm getting dilation elsewhere in my body to compensate, and pretty soon my brain is just going to shut me down. Like that's not useful to think about that, even though if that's correct, and to just think like, you know. If I just want it bad enough and focus and work hard and overcome obstacles that I'm going to get where I want to go is a much more useful way to think about things, even though it's not necessarily correct, let's say. So if it works, then I think the right way of thinking about this is to start a systematic investigation into other, other sports other domains that use this 
and then try to find a body of work because at this stage in 2020, there's definitely going to be a body of work about like what actually works uh, psychologically. Um, so instead of blindly copying them, although you know taxing knowledge, you probably could. Uh, there probably is like some um, 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 core. Uh, thing that you can take and then start experimenting with uh, if you can find the, the right literature. I'm not, I'm not willing to dismiss this entirely because I've listened to a lot of Olympian judokas and part of the training program is also this mental strengthening where they tell you, the coach tells you to imagine game day uh, because judo is very it's very unforgiving. You 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 make the wrong mistake, you get thrown, you're out. You all your dreams, your metal hopes gone, right? So you cannot make uh, the the uh, 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 a tiny mistake at the highest levels of the sport. And so what they do is that they say you need to imagine yourself match by match how you fight, how you perform, so and simulate it into your head all the way to stepping up to the podium and receiving the gold medal, so that when the time comes, it's as if your body is moving and according to a preordained thing right and that's actually part of like what the u.s team trains uh, they actually do pedro talks about like how mental training is a part of their their um uh their regi- regiment like in, in addition to technique and physicality so there's something there something there and i think i'm i truly believe that if there's something there and coaches are using it there's gonna be some psychological or some body of work that probably is terribly named like naturalistic decision making <laughs> that you can mine for for ideas to test yeah i i think that the um judo is probably a little bit different in terms of the the skill set um compared to something like like crossfit or like a more endurance sport true, um true. i i will say that I, that in terms of like actual literature etc that there's a pretty interesting if we talk specifically about like crossfit or other endurance sports um there, there's a lot of interesting fatigue literature that sort of um you you, you can use concepts surrounding essentially like rate of perceived exertion so how difficult something is and your motivation to overcome it as like a a, oh. a pretty robust model for fatigue and you know you can take all of those physiological things that are actually going on and sort of aggregate them up into you know what is your rate of perceived exertion and then what is your motivation to actually overcome that and so it doesn't mean motivation in the sort of like colloquial sense that people right. talk about like oh i'm motivated to work out today you know it, it sort of means yeah it it's it, it's it's a much more um specific thing in terms of like how willing am i to push through this degree of effort right now and you it's will at it. some point hit hard physiological limits as to what you can and can't do yes. But, you know, a lot of this sort of like fluffy stuff that, you know, rubs me the wrong way is probably actually effective for a lot of people to maximally increase their motivation to train on a sort of daily basis, right? And that that the important thing to them is to maximize their motivation, not to be, you know, super rigorous in how you're talking about it. Yep, yep. So probably all the knowledge that you have about the biomechanics probably better lives in the coach's head, not yeah. in the not in the athlete's head. The athlete's head would probably devolve. I'm sort of imagining. So I'm not a CrossFitter, but I, I run uh, now in the in the pandemic. Um, yeah. And 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 you, we all know how it feels like to be like half dead, and you have like another three kilometers, four kilometers to go, right? Um, so. I, I think at that state of mind, uh, the brain just devolves to what it knows, which is stories, right? So you need to find effective stories to keep them going. So maybe that's what's going on. But I'm out of my depth here. Uh, yeah. I, I would, yeah. So I, I would trust whatever you're saying and whatever you've seen to work. And I think there's something there you should go dig. <laughs> yeah, totally. And, and, and I think that the um, another interesting aspect, I'm curious, curious if you have any thoughts mm. about this, you know, for judo or, or, or really anything, um, would just be thinking about uh, like the, the predictive processing model of cognition, right, oh, for wow. actually pushing through <laughs> things like that, right? So it, to the, the idea of visualization, I think, you know, sounds fluffy to someone, but if you frame it more in terms of like predictive processing, it can make a lot of sense where you're like, okay, mm. you're sort of setting yourself up to have a certain prior that you're coming into a situation with. And then you're going to be updating based upon your actual feedback from the situation based upon your prior, right? So if you visualize something going well, then your prior is that it's going well. <laughs> 
and you're updating mm. based upon it going well. And like, yes, at some point you may end up having to make a really hard update and it's not going well, but that, that, you know, if your prior is, this is going to go well, that's probably a much better spot to compete in anything physical than it's not going to go well. Huh? So, wow. I, I, I wonder if that's the right level of abstraction to think though, if you're, if you're a, an athlete, right? Do you, do you really need to think about the predictive model of cognition or are you talking from no. the perspective of a coach who wants to know why this works? Yeah. I, th I think much more from a coach, right? But there's, there's probably right. some athletes who would resonate with that. But again, it's just like, why does stuff that sounds like bullshit actually work <laughs> well for athletes? Oh, I, I would say that that, implies that something is wrong in your understanding of the world and you should go investigate. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I totally buy that it works though, because I don't think about science when I'm in like the last <laughs> stretch of a very long run. I'm like, uh, just folk, uh, I don't know, like there's a bunch of tricks that I use, but like one of them that I use is just like focus on your cadence uh, and focus on getting your form right. Uh, that resonates with me because in judo, like a lot, there's a lot of technique uh, practice that requires good form, uh, otherwise the throw wouldn't work, right? And so, so, so then I can go into this like sort of fugue state where I'm not state that I'm not thinking about anything. Um, I I don't know, but it sounds like if I were you, I would start investigating people who have successfully or are a bit more thoughtful around the way they deploy stories. Uh, to infect their, their athletes' heads and to change the way the, the, you know, the, the athletes tell stories to themselves. I would go investigate who does it systematically, what have they learned, and then try to explicate their models of like what, what stories to tell. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that would yeah. be my approach. Totally. And so I, I wanted to also jump back to something that you started to talk sure. about that I think was one of the most interesting things um, that that was in one of your articles is just this idea of actually getting better at doing trial and error and right. learning the right things from trial and error. Right. Cause I think that that's something that, again, that's very subtle, but you know, if we're thinking about someone who's biased towards action and is kind of like rapidly iterating, you know, in the case of business or, you know, coaching or developing software or whatever, you know, that that skill of actually getting better at doing that trial and error is probably one of the most important things. So what 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 makes someone better at trial and error? Um I've I've not historically I've not been very good at trying to explain this because I'm not convinced that I found the, the best way. But I've found I found some better ways. So like one very obvious thing is uh you want to optimize for what is useful. So when you do try and error and you fail right? Um, example could be you read a technique in a book. Uh, the example that I like to give in my blog post is Deep Work by Cal Newport, where he talks about taking breaks from concentration. Uh, sorry, taking breaks from distraction instead of taking breaks from concentration. And that's really hard to do, especially today when we have our phones with us and with Twitter and Facebook, right? Um, and I've tried it many times. I have failed multiple times because it's really difficult to do. And when you fail, you come up with a bunch of possible reasons for why you fail. This is true of everything, whether you're trying a new technique in sport or you are experimenting with some new way of hiring people and then you hire somebody who's absolutely horrible, right? Um, you should conclude the most useful thing first and order the possible reasons according to the most useful thing. So with an example of Cal Newport, one very possible reason uh, is that he has better genetics <laughs> and therefore he's able to concentrate better and he's smarter and there's some correlation there and he went to MIT, he did his postdoc in MIT, right? So maybe he is built in a way uh, that the technique works for him, but it doesn't work for me, right? And that is a plausible truth and there's no way I can actually know if it's true, but because it is less useful, it doesn't come up with new variations uh, that I can try on the technique to, you know, to try to modify it to suit me. I should leave it to the last possible explanation, right? And so I should pick the one that's most useful, which could be that, you know, he has a lousy phone, which he has talked about before. I think he says that he does things to make sure that he doesn't walk with his phone uh, or he does things to his phone to make sure that it's less addictive. That could be one thing. So I could try that next. Um, it could be that he works in academia. Uh, that's also not very useful because there's nothing I can do about that. So I'm going to leave that to the end as well. And so I find that people who do trial and error, 
um, who are less effective at it, they tend to jump to conclusions that are less useful. An example of that would be a manager in one of my previous companies. Uh, I'm sorry, a previous company where like we hired someone from Taiwan and uh, he left us in less than a couple of months because uh, there was a better uh, better pay, like he had a better pay in Singapore for 2x or something like that. And the conclusion was, don't hire people from Taiwan, <laughs> which is not very useful because... <laughs> 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 like there, there's like a dozen possible ver- uh, explanations, right? Like variables that you can tweak before you conclude stop hiring software engineers from Taiwan because there are many benefits for hiring software engineers from Taiwan. There's not a very large software market there. The universities produce top-notch talent, but we have very little competition for those talent, right? So like go through systematically one by one before you conclude don't hire anyone from Taiwan. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Optimize for usefulness is one thing, um, and I, I, I and, that's and, and the, to clarify yeah. on that, sort of like by usefulness, you essentially mean it, it sounds like you're almost saying optimize for something that you potentially have agency over, yes, or is potentially something that is a uh, low barrier to entry, low friction to try. Yes, is that would that be like a good? Yes, absolutely. But of course, with every iteration where you keep going through variations and you keep, you know, coming up with and it keeps failing, obviously at some point you'll be like, oh, I think the probability of this being like Cal Newport has better genetics is high enough that I'm going to like stop experimenting with this technique and move on to another technique. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the skill of getting better at trial and error is something that, you know, sort of like we were talking about earlier, the, uh, the, the tennis players having certain parts of their body blacked out to figure out what's actually going on, you know, that, that maybe even thinking on a meta level about improving the skill of trial and error by, I don't know what we could black out to try to do that. Oh yeah, the, absolutely. Yes. But that's, that's probably a, one of the most worst worthwhile things to do. So bias towards action and figure out how to get better at trial and error. Yes, yes. And I think if you just have those two things, you go really, really far. Because a lot of people, they don't have a bias to action. They get stuck in analysis paralysis. Or at least people like us, uh, yeah. rationality adjacent <laughs> people. <laughs> 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 and, and, and we also, when we do trial and error, um, we get discouraged easily. Or uh, we don't think and we just keep doing... The other really stupid thing is if you repeat the same trial and error without modifying the parameters. And I've seen people do that as well. And you're like, no, why? You're just wasting a lot of energy um, doing the same thing, <laughs> right? So I know people, some people listening to this will say like, oh, that's the scientific method. And maybe it is, um, but it's useful. And so I think I, these are the two most useful things I think that that uh, I found so far. Love it. So Cedric, we've been talking about a bunch of your blog posts what is the deal with your blog and what posts should people read if they liked hearing you talk about them? Ah, um, I guess the Taxit Knowledge series is a good one since we've talked about it. Um, uh, the, the blog is actually built around this central conceit of a career mode, though, because that's the way that I normally think about my career. I believe that if you want to do well in your career, you want to find a moat. Um, something that makes it difficult for people to copy you. Usually a rare and valuable skill, as, as Cal Newport puts it. I think that's the best expression of the idea. Um, and pretty much everything in the blog goes under this umbrella. Like, what are the ways that you can get better at learning, or get better at thinking, so that it gets it eas- it's easier for you to build that career mode in your career, and, and then you have an easier time in your career. Um, so uh, I would say go with... Uh, start with the taxi knowledge series if you're interested in that but then there's also uh, the career mode uh, post where I basically sort of link to most of the things in the blog post and I think that's a good way to get a sampling uh, of, of everything that I write about beautiful and there's also an email list on there, which I wasn't signed up for, even though I've been reading the blog for a little bit so I just signed up right. for that the other day so you got cool. another subscriber thank you um, yeah, the email list is primarily focused around careers again. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, entrepreneurs will find it as useful. Some of my friends who are entrepreneurs say that it is useful, but uh, I primarily write for someone who wants to think about their career and wants you know better uh, ways of thinking about navigating in their career. Well, in general, your writing is crisp and clear and insightful and full of examples from things that I either wish I knew about or know about enough to be excited that they're mentioned. So I look forward to to reading it. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there.